Arrival and the courage to be, facing the abyss of death and non-being. Being includes non-being, and through non-being, it reveals itself. This quote is from Paul Tillich, who was one of the most influential theologians and philosophers of religion from the last century. In this video, I want to explore the meaning of this quote and his main work, The Courage to Be, through the specific example of Denis Villeneuve's movie Arrival and its main protagonist, the character of Luis. So, to start out on this journey, let me introduce you to a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, which Tillich uses and which encapsulates the basic human predicament that we find Luis facing and finally overcoming. Have ye courage, O my brethren, not the courage before witness, but anchorite and eagle courage, which not even God any longer beholds. She has heart, who knows fear, but vanquishes it, who sees the abyss, but with pride. She who sees the abyss, but with eagle's eyes, she who with eagle's talents grasps the abyss, she has courage. What is this abyss that Nietzsche is talking about? I will argue in this essay that it is the threat of non-being and more concretely, death. And it is the confrontation with this inevitable reality which transforms Luis and lastly brings her to a state of being in which she cannot fully affirm her own life but also that of her daughter. When we meet Louise, she holds a professorship at a university and is regarded as one of the leading experts in the field of linguistics. She lives in a beautiful house close to a lake, yet through our perspective in her daily life, we quickly realize that even though all these external markers for happiness are apparent, there is an underlying feeling of detachment and coldness shining through all her actions. This becomes most obvious when even the incredible event of an extraterrestrial landing on Earth doesn't really seem to faze her that much. She continues in her routines, comforts her mother almost in a slightly annoyed fashion and passively consumes the news. During the first viewing of Arrival, we automatically interpret Louis' life through the lens of a grieving mother, as it is only later revealed that the scenes with which the movie starts out have not yet occurred. We see her detachment from life as a way of coping with the loss of her daughter, yet it is not the illness and death of the person she loves most that pushes her towards this self-denying and neurotic behavior, but rather it is the basic experience of modernity, and as that she serves as a great example to highlight a more general trend in our society. The last few centuries have been among the most dynamic and turbulent of known human history. Even though there have been many times throughout the ages where apocalyptic events influenced and forever altered vast numbers of different societies, as it was the case with the Bronze Age collapse or the fall of the Roman Empire. The trend that was started with the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century has now taken on gigantic and global proportions. With few exceptions, there are no human beings left which not at least indirectly feel the impact of this development. The advent of science and technology have been the basis for a continual transformation of the human image and of the way societies function. Speaking now only for the Western world, the shift from the medieval cosmos firmly rooted in scholastic Christianity to the experience of modernity as it is mediated through science and large-scale corporations couldn't be more radical. The whole of Europe has been freed from the dictate of church dogma. We no longer look for answers in religious scripture or long for the absolution of our sins, but rather we turn towards science as a primary tool to orient ourselves in the world. This unrelenting quest for scientific knowledge has removed humans from being at the center of all existence to being located on a small planet that orbits a minor star somewhere out in the spiral arm of a common galaxy, which is in itself just one among many in the immensity of space and time. And even on this planet Earth, we find that we are not particularly special, but just one species among many, thrown forth by the restless creativity of swirling genes. This striving for objective truth, as it can be determined by the natural sciences, is a noble undertaking, as it frees us from superstitious beliefs and empowers us to create ingenious instruments to alter the world. 
However, we as people who just experienced a global pandemic, who witnessed the outburst of another cruel and seemingly insane war, who are confronted with the ecological destruction of our planet, we know that we have lost something essential during the rapid flight from being devout peasants to being global citizens in the information age. This sentiment is perfectly captured in a quote from the book Psychotherapy East and West written by Alan Watts. The liberation by science is by no means complete. That is clear by the fact that 19th century naturalism was the basis for a technological assault on nature without precedent. It leaves us still as strangers in the cosmos, without the judgment of God, but also without his love, without the terrors of hell, but also without the hope of heaven, without many of the physical agonies of pre-scientific times, but also without the sense that human life has any meaning. The Christian cosmos has vanished, but the Christian ego remains, with no resort but to try to forget its loneliness in some sort of collectivism, of huddling together in the dark. Despite all its tremendous success, science hasn't been able to communicate a picture of the world which speaks to more than our intellect. It has demystified every aspect of our lives, leaving us trapped and isolated in our own heads. We looked for the gods in the sky and found only infinite space, dead rocks and orbs of burning gas. We looked for them in thunder and wind and found only unintelligent forces of the atmosphere. Convinced by this superficial success, we proclaimed the death of all the ancient gods and hailed the dawn of an age of reason and progress. We cut all ties with our primitive past, with everything that doesn't fit into the modern conception of a rational human being. Through this limited and impoverished image of ourselves, our psyche got fragmented, and a significant part of it sank into the darkness of unconsciousness. This is the emptiness which we feel in our hearts. This is the cause of our unrelenting longing to somehow fill this void, and no matter how hard we struggle, how much we try to bend our lives into a shape which would make them acceptable to us, we will always fail. For there is nothing that can replace the bond we once shared with the living and breathing earth and the whole of the cosmos. Isolated in our heads, only our ego is what is left to us. In such a world, the pursuit of power, loneliness and anxiety are the only lot of human beings. An all-pervasive pain forces us to find ever new forms of sedation. We will not find the power to heal this split within the world of the light, but only transient distractions. We have to be willing to bow our heads low enough to look into the abyss of non-being so that the soothing waters may wash over us. I will conclude this rather general exploration of the modern predicament with a quote from Tillich in which he identifies the feeling of doubt, present in most of our lives, as a symptom of the meaning crisis. Emptiness and loss of meaning are expressions of the threat of non-being to the spiritual life. This threat is latent in man's finitude and actualized by man's estrangement. It can be described in terms of doubt. Man is able to ask because he is separated from, while participating in, what he is asking about. Doubt is based on man's separation from the whole of reality, on his lack of universal participation, on the isolation of his individual self. So doubt is caused through our intimate awareness that non-being and everything it entails are always near. Doubt casts a shadow over our lives, which drains it of all the colors and leaves us wandering aimlessly, with no orientation besides our whimsical ego which will forever try to convince us that there are alternative realities where we would be happier, more fulfilled and where we would finally overcome our restless driving. Most of the time we are simply content to temporarily escape through some form of distraction. However, we can never get rid of this unnerving presence we sense in our hearts. There the abyss of doubt and non-being lurks, but we don't dare to look, we lack the courage. So this brings you finally back to Arrival. In the beginning of Arrival, Louise is caught in a dissociative state of being. She is detached from her reality precisely because she has lost this authentic connection with herself and the world around. 
When Colonel Weber comes and invites her to lead the translation project, Louise is taken aback by this offer. Tentatively she agrees and joins the team at the landing site. She meets Ian, a theoretical physicist with whom she will coordinate and direct the efforts to establish a way of communication with the alien visitors. After a short briefing, a small group of scientists and soldiers are on their way to the gigantic ship. Smooth and cold stone seem to make up the bulk of the vessel. They are lifted into a rectangular tunnel in which the pull of gravity itself is redirected. Advancing through the tunnel, they get to a large chamber where the opposing end is illuminated, though everything is hidden from sight by a white fog. And then they arrive. Nothing could have prepared Louise and her team for that which they are now confronting. It is the literal other, the mind-bending strangeness of two beings that just through their very existence embody the infinite expanse of our universe. A vastness forever escaping the attempt of the human mind to categorize and understand. Several meetings pass and even though Louise's efforts surpass the attempts of her predecessor, no real progress is achieved. Until, at a critical moment, Louise demonstrates the tremendous courage she is capable of. Against the dictate of protocol and all safety precautions, Louise removes her suit, thereby exposing herself completely to the alien environment. This act could not have been more symbolical. Only when she reveals herself, without any protective shell, without a safe distance to the beings she wants to be in contact with, can there be an authentic exchange. Louis stands in front of the transparent barrier and reaches out. Her gesture is answered, the contact felt and carried out in the flesh. This is the beginning of her familiarization with the alien language and from now on she only improves her understanding of it. This brings me to a brief elaboration on the importance of language and how it fundamentally influences and informs the way we perceive ourselves and the world around us. The underlying scientific theory which gave rise to such an understanding of language is called the Sapir-Whorf Hypothesis. Edward Sapir, the founding father, wrote in his book Language, Human beings do not live in the objective world alone, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. It is quite an illusion to imagine that one adjusts to reality essentially without the use of language and that language is merely an incidental means of solving specific problems of communication or reflection. The fact of the matter is that the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of the group. So language is a primary tool in our attempt to understand and categorize what we see around us. It helps us to differentiate the world into seemingly disparate entities to which we then can relate in a pragmatic manner without being overwhelmed by complexity. So it becomes immediately apparent that the structure of the language we employ and in which we are enmeshed in since we were born is essential to the structure of the world. This is what Edward Sapir argues for, that there is not THE objective reality, but rather that reality is to a significant extent a linguistic construct dependent on the peculiarities of the language we bring to bear on it. His disciple Benjamin Worth, who became one of the most influential linguists of the last century, helped to develop this theory which they termed linguistic relativity by studying the language of the Native American people called the Hopi. He claimed that Hopi language fundamentally differs from most Indo-European languages in that it portrays the concept of time in a unique way. For them, time was not this absolute entity which could be packaged in discrete instants neatly following one after the other, but rather time was understood as a continuous single process with no independent reference point outside this flow from where to judge and evaluate temporal duration. Even though their theory was and is heavily disputed, over the last few decades there has been a resurgence of interest, especially in the fields of psychology and neuroscience. Thereby, the insights from linguistic relativity are taken from the mostly abstract realm of linguistics and applied to the investigation of our cognition. This is the premise on which the story of arrival rests, that the workings of our cognition 
are to a large extent dependent upon the language we speak, and that through acquiring the capability to speak a new language, we internalize a completely new mode of thinking and being. After the initial step to breathe the distance between herself and the alien visitors, Louis dives deeply into the learning process. In the beginning, the task was perceived to be nearly impossible, but now she welcomes the challenge. The main characteristic of the heptapod language is its circular nature. If we take seriously the theory of linguistic relativity, the implications from such an understanding of reality are radical and force us to let go of nearly all familiar concepts. Beginnings and ends are no longer perceived to be different, but rather aspects of an underlying identity. The law of causation is broken up, and rather than being an arrow pointing distinctively in one direction, it becomes a loop of mutual feedback. However, I don't think that it was a goal of arrival to spark an intellectual discussion on such abstract matters. Moreover, it is an invitation to feel, with Louise and for ourselves, how the gift that opens up time would transform our lives. For Louise, it begins with intimations and visions of a brown-haired girl unfamiliar to her. Like memories from the distant past, these waves wash against her, leaving her confused and wandering. After the attack carried out by the rogue soldiers, Louise tries to re-establish the contact. She drives underneath the spaceship and a small probe takes her on board. For the first time now, she is completely immersed in the alien environment. White fog permeates everything from which the lonely Costello emerges. Then it is revealed that the weapon, the tool which the Heptobots brought to Earth, is not some external object, but rather the language itself. A language that allows cognition to transcend the entrapment of linear time and to perceive the whole of reality as an ongoing circular process. Without her knowledge, this gift was shared with Louise. As her mind was gradually unfolding, she became more and more receptive to those experiences that would one day become her present. It is this moment that we as an audience realize for the first time that we are not witnessing the memories of Louise's deceased daughter, but rather that we are peering into the actual future. After this revelation, Louise is brought back to the surface. There she uses her altered sense of time to resolve the global crisis that was escalating further and further. But this is not what I want to focus on. Rather, I want to focus on her personal life, on the decisions she makes which bring her into a direct confrontation with death. Subsequent to all the turmoil, Louise and Ian are standing in the open. Despite the short time Louise had to integrate what just happened to her, she is calm and collected. She sees all of her existence as one great nexus of simultaneousness. From this high vantage point, it is directly evident that every beginning implies an ending. The birth of her daughter, her subsequent illness and death are one process, one small aspect of the amazing happening which we call life. To only focus and cling to one side, thereby completely neglecting the other, would result in the self-denying state of being in which Louise was trapped when we first met her. But now, everything has changed. She sees birth and death, the moments of beauty and joy, but also the times of sorrow and grief. Despite knowing the journey and where it leads, I embrace it. And I welcome every moment of it. Louis sees it all, fully accepting what is and what isn't. She stands before Ian and in an embrace which echoes through all her life, she personifies that love triumphs over death. In the face of tremendous loss, what is required from us is tremendous courage. This is what Louise is manifesting, and this is what the contemplation of death can elicit in each of us. For Tillich, such an act even takes on divine significance. Louise, through the power of her affirmation, aligns herself with the fundamental force which sustains our universe living creativity, eternally conquering its own non-being. In the end, all such big statements don't amount to anything if they not also directly influence our actions. It is here that we have to realize that even though we may not be aware of these specific details, 
We all know how our journey will come to a close. We will die at some point. Knowing this, what is there to do? Being asked the same question, Ian gives the answer for us. Maybe I say what I feel more often, I, I don't know. So to live in the presence of death means to honor our hearts. It means to be kind and gentle, because we don't have forever. Each moment felt and accepted in its wholeness is a gift beyond imagining. Each breath an invitation to extend the boundaries of our care and compassion. Let us do away with this shy coldness that we allow to take over, in which we go through life but always one step away, always safely in the distance, always right there but missing everything. So, I invite you to come these steps with me. Let us reclaim our birthright to feel at home in the world and in ourselves.